The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Detroit Basketball! Welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, and my partner, Malik Hill. We are at the end of May, and we finally have our NBA Finals matchup. The Miami Heat are taking on the Denver Nuggets. The Boston Celtics did not break the record of losing. And so now we have two teams that have kind of uh, battled some injuries. I guess the Nuggets over the last couple of years, then the Heat kind of this season. Um, but the Heat did it, and the Nuggets both kind of played the way we both kind of like teams to play, where it's like not one guy kind of carrying the team. Now, yes, you could say Jimmy Butler and Jokic are like the key pieces to those teams, but at different times, other people have stepped up uh, to put that team in positions to win. Um, but going back to the Heat Celtics, um, I don't remember. Did we, we didn't talk about game six, right? No. <clears throat> game six was on a Thursday, I believe. You want to give a quick recap, recap of the game six, and then we'll talk about game seven a little. So <clears throat> I almost lost all faith in Jimmy Butler in one game. Yeah. Because for the first three and a half quarters, it was just bad. It was it was not good. Jimmy couldn't get anything to fall. He was too aggressive, and it seemed like he was forcing it. At the same time, Bam Adebayo could barely do anything. The, the two stars just weren't looking good. But Boston was also sketchy. Yeah. They started kind of hot, and then they just started going up and down a little bit. And they played around enough to just let Miami get back into the game in the fourth quarter. Uh, a few Duncan Robinson threes. The, his deep three got them and within one point, I think, or tied the game. Yeah. And then it also uh, kind of lost them the game towards the end. Yeah. And then it's Caleb Martin, right? Not Cody. Yeah, Caleb Martin. And then Caleb Martin, at first in game six, played great. Mm -hmm. Hit shots whenever the Heat needed them. The rest of the team stepped up and hit shots to keep them within the game whenever they needed. Like I said, Duncan Robinson hit those threes, tied the game. Then they just started going back and forth for like the last two minutes. And then Jimmy Butler, some people say he did get fouled. Some people say he didn't. Right. He was going to force up a three in the corner. Al Horford went to swipe. It looked like he might have <laughs> made contact with his arm, mm -hmm. and the refs blew the whistle. Yeah. It was inconsistent refing all throughout the game, just like it has been all throughout these playoffs. Mm. So I don't see how people can complain. Yeah. Jimmy Butler calmly hits all three free throws and plays well in the fourth quarter. So he kind of kind of redeems himself by putting them up by one with was it it was like two point one seconds on the clock at first and then it became three. I can't yeah, yeah they, something around there. Yeah, added, they added point nine for some reason, and nobody still knows. Mm -hmm. Celtics inbounded on their side of the court. Marcus Smart shoots a fadeaway three. It rolls in and out. And it looked like the buzzer went off and the game was over. But then things got too interesting, especially for Miami Heat fans. Things got way too spicy. Derek White just happened to fly right under the ball as it was falling out of the rim mm -hmm. and tip it in perfectly with 0. .2 seconds left on the clock. The refs go to check it. They immediately say to Celtics win, and the entire arena just goes dead. Like, it's <laughs> – the fans can't believe it. Yeah. The, 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 the Miami Heat, they're just sitting on the bench in disbelief. They can't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I texted, oh, my God, in the group chat because it just didn't seem real. 
Mm. Like I, the odds of that play happening are so slim to me. Like Derek White has to be in the perfect position for the rebound. He can't shoot the ball too hard or it like bounces right off the backboard. He lays it up perfectly. Everything just goes right in point two seconds for the Celtics and they win game six. Yeah. The wild thing is you say that it's uh, almost unbelievable the way that it had to happen, but at the same time, the way that it happened was because to down to basic fundamentals. Max yes. Struess was guarding the inbounder. He was caught looking. He hedged for the possibility for them to go to Jason Tatum. They didn't go to Jason Tatum because of it, but then he did not immediately get yeah. back to his man as the ball was getting inbounds, and Derek Wright, White ran past him, and he was behind him the whole way, so Derek White had a clean look. And, yeah, I mean, he timed it perfectly, but uh, it was it was pretty crazy. The uh, Heat had all the momentum towards the end of that game, and they blew it. Yeah, we also didn't mention two Duncan Robinson threes or wide open. in the last 130. Both of them in transition. Was the first one where he drew, where he caught it and dribbled, or was that the second one? Yeah. First one, he catches it, hesitates a little, dribbles to get comfortable, shoots, backs off, I mean, bounces off the other side of the rim. Yeah. Second one, wide open in transition again, this time on the left side of the court. Mm-hmm. This time he doesn't hesitate, instantly shoots it, bounces off the back of the rim. That one just a little bit behind the line. Yeah. But yeah, I... It's it's unfortunate because it was it was funny that like I was making fun of him for the first one when he when he took the dribble to shoot because a lot of the times when I watch that's a bad omen and even like when I would play I consider myself a good three point shooter that if you have to do that and take time to collect yourself you're usually going to overthink it because if you just catch and shoot you don't think and you just do what's natural for your body so. I know the NBA is a little different. Sometimes those guys, they take that dribble, they get comfortable, and then they feel like they're in a practice facility and they can knock it down every time. But it always makes me nervous when guys do it either way. Um, but then on the other side, he, like you said, he, he pretty much caught and shoot it, shot it, and then uh, still missed it. So just wasn't, wasn't his time to win a game, I guess. Yeah, and even when they lost the game, I couldn't get, re- I really couldn't get mad at Duncan because he, he took the shots when they needed him. Mm hmm. And he was a big factor in them getting back into the game because all of those cuts to the rim where he got those layups with defenders trailing right behind him and then those two big threes to get them tied in the game, he did everything he could to get them to a win. Right. He just happened to miss two shots. Yeah. And then we get to game seven. So the Celtics are looking. Did either of us think Miami had a chance? I I thought they were mentally done. I I, I honestly thought. I I didn't know how Miami could recover. So, it's funny, and I didn't end up doing it because I told myself I'm not going to bet anymore. But I said, I, I think Miami was like plus 260. And I said, man, that should be like the easiest bet of my life. And I wanted to do like, and then even my brother, my brother's buddy uh, mentioned at our cookout that, you know, you could do the Heat plus 260 and then Jimmy Butler to score 20, have like seven rebounds and five assists or something. He did all that in the game. Yeah. Um, Every single would have bit of netted, netted you amount a good amount of money, and I was like, man, I wish I would have taken that. But you know, that's betting. But um, no, I, I, I mean, yes, I was definitely nervous because it's at home. Boston's kind of feeling like they had momentum, not realizing Boston already lost two games at home. Yeah, not even thinking about that fact. Mm-hmm. But um, I was just going with history. You know, nobody has ever come back from yeah. a seven game like from a three zero deficit. Yes, they made it all the way to the seventh game, but history still stands. I'm glad it was wasn't the Celtics that broke that record. That would have been obnoxious for me. Um, and I just think the Heat. I mean, the Heat definitely showed up, and they deserved it. The Celtics looked awful, and I don't know about you, but I think this this Celtics team has to change things up. They've made it to four conference finals. They failed three, made it to the finals once, and also Steph, Steph went it. full Steph. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have both shown they're super inconsistent. Sometimes they're really clutch, and sometimes they just hurt the team. 
the whole time. Uh, so they have to figure out something for this team. I think it, it sounds like recently that Jalen Brown is going to sign an extension, but will it be with the Celtics? I, I don't know. Cause it, Brad Stevens, I feel like he's smarter than a GM that would pay Jalen Brown almost. I, I don't even want to say the number. Yeah. <laughs> um. So, I don't know. I think the Celtics are at that point that many good teams face, where they might be due for a change, um, because they're just they're just not getting it done. Um, and I wouldn't say that it's one one person in particular. Oh, it, it's multiple things, and I think just a few things on that list: the the lack of a true point guard. Two three years ago, there were rumors that Boston was looking to get like Lonzo Ball. When he was leaving New Orleans, he ends up going to Chicago. Before he got hurt, and it, lo- it looks like he might not play again, which is sad. It looked like he was the catalyst to Chicago making a comeback. Yeah. Because he was playing the best basketball of his career. They could have used a guy like him. Yeah. You trade for Malcolm Brogdon. You bring him off the bench. I feel like he should have been starting from the jump and could have been your true point guard. Mm-hmm. But he comes off as more of like a scoring playmaker role. Right. Marcus Smart is kind of your point guard, combo guard, not good enough mm-hmm. in those types of, in those areas. He's good in defense and hitting shots when you need him, but can't get the offense where it needs to be yeah. at certain times. The coach. What do you do about Joe Mazzula? He had things that went against him. Mm-hmm. And him making it this far, going down 3-0 and getting it to a game seven, I think I might give him another chance. I think so, too. Because, just because, I mean, yeah. like I said, this this team has been there. Like, they were in the finals before. Um, they've failed other times with different coaches. Yeah. So With Brad Stevens. Right. So, to me, it seems like it's not just necessarily the coaching. That's the problem. It could It could very well be, but I think not at this moment, I guess. Yeah. And now you're seeing, I don't know if you saw, Ime Udoka has taken three assistants. Mm. from the Boston bench. And they had already lost their best assistants last year, and they just kept Joe Mazzula and made him the head coach. Mm. So, yeah, there's, like you said, several areas yeah. where they have decisions to make, right. including players also. Yeah. Uh, so now that we've gotten to the Heat Nuggets, that series will start tomorrow for the NBA Finals. Um, do any of your opinions change? Do you think that like it feels like Denver is just going to walk away with his championship? Or do you think Miami has like an actual chance? If Caleb Martin <laughs> continues to average almost 20 and six on like 50, 40, 90 splits. Yeah. Miami might have a chance every game, but other people have to step up. Also Gabe Vincent. He hits big shots when the team needs it. Duncan Robinson has reappeared and showed his confidence again. Mm hmm. Max Struess showed in the first few rounds he can hit shots. Kyle Lowry is gritty, but he's he's kind of fallen off in terms of stats. Kevin Love hasn't played much. It was kind of a mismatch thing in the Boston series, though. Yeah. They need Bam Adebayo to play like a high-level big consistently in a series. And I think they they probably need Tyler Hero to be back by, like, game three. This Miami Heat team has made an incredible run as an eighth seed that almost lost to Chicago in the playing game. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you're going up against a team that is prepared in every single facet, every area. They've got it. They got everything they need Mm -hmm. to win the championship. Nikola Jokic, you got the super duper all time star. Jamal Murray, you got the, the ultimate heater. That when no when Jokic comes out the game, he can just go off. Mm-hmm. Aaron Gordon can do everything. Michael Porter Jr. is your best shooter. Bruce Brown comes off the bench as a guy that's just he, they they don't have many flaws right now. Mm-hmm. So you you've got to get everything you can, including a somewhat healthy Tyler Hero, because it's going to be hard for them to keep up on offense. To me, yeah, unless they keep shooting hot, which Gabe Vincent, Max Drews, Duncan Robinson. Caleb Martin, if they can stay on these heaters, they'll have a chance. Yeah. Because the way Eric Spolster coaches their defense, the way they go in and out of zones and keep teams confused, 
it could affect the way Denver plays. Right. It could. But then once again, you see how smart Nikola Jokic is and how well they play as a team. Like it's 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 just tough for Miami in this one. Yeah. It's so tough. Yeah, I don't really see too many paths for Miami winning the series. Um if, I think if Miami can get it to six, that would probably be the I, yeah. I I honestly don't see a scenario where they get it to seven. Yeah, I think Denver's just so locked in. Yeah, and we kind of talked about it last week or mentioned it. Like the matchups just don't work well for Miami. Like they're just not favored in any of those matchups. I don't know who really can stop Jamal Murray necessarily. And even if they do, then you're leaving Michael Porter Jr. open most likely, Aaron Gordon. Uh, you know, Jokic versus Bam should be fun. Uh, but like, who are they going to put Jimmy Butler on? I assume Jimmy goes on um, Jamal Murray. Oh yeah, that's what we yeah that's what we mentioned. Yeah, Jimmy on Murray, and so then it that yeah, yeah. so then it creates that mismatch for like Michael Porter Jr. or something. So it just makes it tough for sure. And then you know one of the least defensive guys are probably going to also go on to KCP probably, and he's been playing really well. KCP lately. can can chase Max Drews around right and Duncan whatever he comes in the game. Yeah. So it's going to be tough, but I'm excited. NBA Finals, uh, we're almost to the end of the NBA season, which is wild to think about. Um, but after you know the lottery and everything, I'm kind of ready for football season. Uh, so we'll Just, get yeah, August college yeah. football starts. And the wild thing too is the Pistons still don't even have a head coach. Yeah, uh, there done, was news today that they're trying to go hard for Monty Williams. Yeah, but it doesn't, it would be nice if that could happen. It but. doesn't sound like they're too successful at it. From what I've been hearing, um, so they might have to be on to you know the Kevin Hollies or the Jaron Collins and call Sam Cassell. Come on, it's just gonna be sad either way. He um, could be Detroit's Willie Green, but a coach that has been signed is Nick Nurse. Not surprising. Um, one of the better coaches, Nick Nurse, is now the Philadelphia 76ers head coach. Um, we'll see if that moves the needle. Uh, obviously, like we said, Doc Rivers needed to get out of there. So Nick Nurse comes in. He also has, you know, he has championship experience at this point. Um, I feel like he's done a good job for the teams that he's had over the last couple of years. Uh, so why not? I think he's a, he's a solid coach. The other one that's still sitting out there is uh, Budenholzer. Yeah, Mike Budenholzer is still kind of sitting out there. So um, and not too many of those dominoes have fallen yet. I'm not sure if some of these coaches are still waiting for off-season moves and actual draft stuff. Um, it's hard to say. But, um, yeah. The other little news and tidbit, which it, it's not too surprising, but a little bit surprising, is that Bob Myers stepped down from the Warriors' uh, GM position. And, uh, yeah. So they, they're they another team that we kind of talked about that they needed some sort of change because their identity has just – differed a little bit these last couple of years and although they won last year this year just from from this year to last year there was already like a big gap in like the way they played defense and things like that so I think they needed somebody to come in from the higher up position than just coaching because you're not going to get rid of Steve Kerr um, to maybe have a different idea of what to how to build a team around Stephen Clay I don't know who they That's get in Clay there stays. Yeah, there's a lot of ifs and Steph is the only like automatic right. Yeah, now. It, Draymond to Jordan Poole probably gone. A lot of people are saying. Um, so I'm not sure like who's out there for GM type kind of roles. Like that's not. We need Chris in for that uh, <laughs> yeah. kind of role, but um, I think it's a good a good thing for the Warriors, um, just to say the least. Um, do you have any opinions on the, the Bob Myers thing? Or Nick Nurse, he for that matter. will probably go down as one of the greatest GMs in NBA history. Because maintaining that level of play, mm -hmm. even when you have a Steph Curry who's almost top, top 10 all time, a lot of people already have him in their top 10. You draft Steph Curry, you draft Klay Thompson, you draft Draymond Green, you hit on all of them, you win some championships, you bring in KD to win some more. Mm-hmm. And then you trade for Andrew Wiggins. Everybody assumed was done. 
basically had no more real value. He buys into the culture immediately. Mm-hmm. You draft Jordan Poole. People were kind of confused by that. And then you win another title against Boston with Jordan Poole and Andrew Wiggins playing great in the finals. Mm-hmm. Like it, everything he built in the past decade is just all time great. He, he hit on so many things. Now he's missed on a few in the last few years, which is why I'm sure he felt like it was time for him to step down. But he's, he's one of the great GMs of our time in sports, honestly. Yeah. Because of everything he just hit on mm-hmm. and how he knew how to correctly build that team. Right. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, a lot of question marks for the, the off season, which this off season is starting to become pretty big just because of the big name coaches. Uh, free agents won't be too crazy. I think Zach Levine is probably the biggest free agent out there. That's a... Uh... Kind of underwhelming, yeah. if we're being honest. Yeah. If that's the big name. Um, so, yeah. Um, we also mentioned last week that we might talk about baseball. We decided we're not going to talk about the Tigers necessarily today. Um, they're still fighting to get to 500. Yeah. They're, they're second. We love what, the fight they have. They're second in the Central right now, but uh, they do have some injuries yeah. going on. They lost to the Rangers yesterday. They're playing the Rangers right now, mm-hmm. and the score is... Um, Oh, they won. Oh. They beat the Rangers 3-2. to two. So okay. they're kind of like win-loss, win-loss right now. Yeah. And uh, they have some some key guys on injury. So they're kind of we'll, – we'll get to them. But we also mentioned that we wanted to get back into the, the like, fun summer episodes. So we're going to, like, slowly start into that uh, this week. We decided since we're not going to talk about the Tigers specifically, we're going to talk about our favorite baseball players. Uh, because both Malik and I don't really watch as much baseball anymore, uh, but we used to watch it quite a bit. So we're going to do a top five list today. Um, I do plan on getting together. I don't know if maybe we'll get another person, but I know my brother would be interested in doing the hated basketball players list. Um, so that one we can do a full episode on at some point. Um but yeah, so we just thought we'd do some top five baseball players. I can't remember if we've done it before or not. And if we have, it's probably been since the beginning of the podcast. So maybe we'll see if our lists change. Or maybe we've never done it before and now we finally get to find out. Um, so without further ado, we're doing our top five all-time favorite baseball players. And I'll start just because... I could not decide a top five because I started looking at a list of players and just kind of kept picking and picking and picking. So I'm going to do top five pitchers and top five batters, but I'll go quickly so that we have time, which we should have plenty of time either way. So for my number five pitcher comes in a, at one point, Detroit Tiger, but that's not where he, uh, maybe got his fame or where his best years were. Um, He had an unorthodox throwing style, um, and he was a part of the, what, 2003 championship with uh, Miguel Cabrera on the Florida Marlins. My number five pitcher is Dontrell Willis, the D train. Wow. Um, Lefty. So the reason that he's on my list is because I was a big fan of just like as a kid, the Marlins logo. That's always a catch for me. Um, as a kid, I'll I'll latch on to logos. Um, I just like that he seemed like he put his entire body into his pitch. It was really kind of awkward. Um, really high leg kick, which was the way that I liked watching pitchers pitch. It just looked fun, I guess, and exaggerated. And... Uh, yeah, so when he came to the Tigers, I was really excited about it, but um, he didn't do so well. He got a little injured. He was already kind of getting aged out at that point. Um, he didn't have a great career overall, but he had a couple dominant years. Um, my number five batter was very hard to figure out where to put him on the list because um, he's one of the better uh, power hitters of all time, and... You know, he had a long, long career with the Angels. That's kind of where I know him best. I can't remember where he kind of bounced around towards the end of his career. I think it was with Texas. 
I think it was with the Rangers at one point. Um, but now his son plays in baseball, and his son is also pretty good. Uh, my number five batter is Vladimir Guerrero. Um, not only for a kid to just see Vladimir Guerrero as like a fun name, um, growing up again, playing video games, I tended to find him on teams that I would play because me and my brother always did fantasy tr- drafts no matter what kind of game we played. So we'd pick our players. He was always towards the top of the list. Big power hitter. and He just looked cool when he hit. Yeah. Like watching the home run derp, seeing him hit with no gloves. Mm-hmm. Like that always used to stand out to me. Like this dude, like he comes up with like yeah. all confidence and no fear. Mm-hmm. He just swings. Yeah. And he had one of the prettiest swings. Yep. He had, he had the dreads with was, which was a nice look. Um, just kind of added to his swagger that he had. And he was just a, like a big guy too. Yeah. Like big he's upper li- he's body. He's listed at six three two thirty five. Yeah. And he was, it was just all upper body. It felt like. Um, so he made it to my number five, Vlad Guerrero. That's a great pick right there. Yeah. My number five is the only current player on my list. The only pitcher on my list, but he's more than a pitcher. He has a big bat. He has a full array of pitches. Most of them good, some of them great. He's just a phenom, something we've never seen in baseball. He is a player that I will monthly, I'll watch monthly highlights of him just to like watch in awe of what he does. That's Shohei. Mm-hmm. Shohei Otani. Ever since he came into the league and the rumors of how great he was going to be and how he was going to pitch and hit, and he was high level at both, mm-hmm. there were a lot of doubters. Some people figured he could do it. And he just lit everything on fire. I mean, that season he had, was it last year? Over 40 homers. And, like, yeah, he was at the highest level of both hitting and pitching. Mm-hmm. And he makes it look easy. Yeah. And he, he has that quiet swagger where he doesn't have to say anything. His his presence, his like, his size, he's, like, he's got to be at least, like, 6'4", like, 250. He's a big guy. Mm-hmm. And when he steps up either to the mound or up to the plate to bat, it's clear that people know who he is. Yeah. And yesterday, I think against the White Sox, he had two home runs in a game. He's just, he is on a different level. Mm -hmm. And I hate that he plays in this era because I feel feel like if he played before us or during while, while we watched baseball in the 2000s, it would be a different level of, attention and notice on Shohei. Yeah. I agree. He would he would probably be in my list almost immediately if I was still watching baseball as much as I do. Yeah. He is literally the reason why I started to tune back into baseball just a little bit. Uh the first year that they um announced that he was coming over to the US and that he was going to play for the Angels, I immediately found myself in just a random fantasy baseball league. And no matter where I was in the draft, I took him first. Um, and that was kind of like just to get me into it and watch. And what he does is so cool because nobody else does it nowadays. Um, pitchers are on pitch counts and all this stuff that I don't like about the game. Yet he's playing two positions and doing it very effectively at both of those positions. Uh, it's just it's fun to watch. So I agree. That's a good pick. Um, my number four pitcher is Tim Lincecum from the San Francisco Giants. Um, and again, he had somewhat of an awkward throwing motion. He would twist his body very far back. A lot of people said that it's what ruined his career. It's the way that he threw, um, put him through a lot of injuries. Because when he would throw, he would throw across his body and really like throw downward towards the ground even. Um, But man, there was a couple years where he was just dominant. Um, And he was one of the best strikeout guys. The way that I found him too was funny because I was playing fantasy baseball a lot way back in the day. And people kept talking about, oh, Tim Lincecum, he's going to be garbage. He's 
got a weird throwing style and all this stuff. So I drafted him, I think his rookie year, I don't remember when that was, um, in like the eighth round of a baseball draft. And that was the year that he like popped off. Same year, I believe that um, Cliff Lee also popped off with like a 22-3 and three season with the um, Indians at the time. Um, that was my first fantasy baseball championship <laughs> was that season Nice, um, because my pitchers were dominant. Um, and I just followed him kind of wherever he went. Yes, the end of his career was kind of uh, muddled with injuries and kind of lackluster um, performances, but there was just that that wheelhouse of when he was dominant that was so fun to watch. So that's why he was number four on my list. And my number four batter is my only Tiger baseball player. That's disappointing. I know. Uh, you got so, two lists and one Tiger. Yeah, and um, it was weird because I, I wrote down Miguel Cabrera. He didn't make the list. Um, Miggy was really, really close. Justin Verlander was also really, really close. Um, and I just, I don't know. I couldn't put them in the top five. But the guy that I could put in my top five, just because he seems like such a good guy, he was fun to watch. He played outfield, one of my favorite positions, Curtis Granderson. He no just idea. felt like a tiger. Um, the only thing that hinders his career is he went to the Yankees and that hurt so much. But what about thing- Johnny Damon going from the Yankees to the Tigers? How's that? I hate Johnny Damon. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry for bringing up Johnny Damon. I hated Johnny Damon. I hated Gary Sheffield. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Curtis Granderson. The other thing that I liked about Curtis Granderson's game, he did a little bit of everything. He was a guy that could hit for decent average. His average was never like crazy good, um, but decent average could get doubles and triples. He was fast enough. He could get some steals every once in a while. Had just enough power to hit some home runs. Um, he hit more home runs at Yankee Stadium. Mm, go figure. <laughs> um, and uh, I don't know. He just seemed like he was that that guy that kind of started the core of the Tigers way back when, before you know we got Miguel and Prince Fielder and all the yeah. bigger names uh, later. Wasn't he there for the 07 run? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so he was just one of my favorite players. I like his stance too. He sat really low in the batter's box. Um, and he was just fun to watch. And yeah, every interview that I ever watched, everybody that I ever said that or ever talked to that interacted with him just said that he was a really good guy, which I think, you know, doesn't play into a lot, but it definitely helps. Um, so I think Curtis Granderson, probably my favorite, uh, tiger player of all time. But special shout outs to Carlos Guillen as well. I'll, he was one of my favorite other favorite Tigers that I didn't mention. Who's your number four? Listen. Great minds think alike, Joey. Okay. And that's why I got Vlad Guerrero as my number four favorite baseball player. Yeah. That's right. Listen, I I, I miss the days where MLB All-Star break would be coming up, and I would be excited to watch all the events during the weekend. Mm-hmm. And one guy that I would always look forward to seeing was Vlad Guerrero during that home run derby. Mm-hmm. I, was, I said when you were talking about him, the no gloves, the dreads, sometimes he would like either take his hat off or flip it backwards mm-hmm. when he was like really starting to get going. Yeah. It just his entire like energy and the way he played the game, I just I loved everything about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Montreal Expos <laughs> late 90s, early 2000s uniform was one of my favorite of all time, their jersey. He was an all-star for the Expos. That's where he first started blowing up. Mm-hmm. I, I just was a fan of the way Vlad Guerrero went about his business. Yeah. And how powerful of a hitter he was. Big fan of Vlad. Nice. My number three pitcher... I'm curious if you know who this is. Um, again, you know, it goes into the the team that it was. It was the Tampa Bay Rays. Um, so I liked the logo. I liked the team. Um, this was the time where I was heavily playing fantasy baseball. He's not the most flashy pl- pitcher. He had a couple really dominant years. Um, he just 
low ERA, didn't really do anything special. Sometimes the way I liked uh, that he played was because he didn't do anything crazy flashy. So my number three favorite pitcher, and not only just because, also not just because of the logo, but also just I liked his name, Scott Kazmir. I think I've heard the name, but yeah, I'm not <laughs> very familiar with Scott Kazmir. Yeah. That's a deep cut. Yes, it is. and it's, I love it. It's very into my kind of favorites, just kind of random guys. Um, but he had a couple good years. Um, I think the, the one year he had, he had like an 18 and five season with like an under two point ERA. Um, so he was just kind of that under the radar kind of guy that I always like. Um, but yeah, my number three batter again, goes to the team, goes to the logo, a Baltimore Oriole and a shortstop Miguel Tejada. Shots out to Miguel Tejada, man. I, I feel, like that. I feel like that era, he gets forgotten about. Underrated. A lot of the time. Also, was at Oakland A. Yeah. On the Moneyball team. <laughs> Best player yeah. on the Moneyball team, Miguel Tejada. Yeah. Um, but I, I liked shortstop quite a bit because it was kind of that unusual position. Um, he's another one of those guys could kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, able to steal some bases early on in his career, had a little bit of power for a shortstop. That wasn't uh, a big thing back then. Um, so being able to do that was kind of cool. Again, just being a Baltimore Oriole, I'm like, oh, that's a cool team. Let's check out some of their better players. And Miguel Tejada was there. The name is fantastic. Tejada is a great last name. Um, so yeah, just I loved watching him play, and it was a it was a fun fun time. Your number three. My number three is a guy that started to, not started to, honestly built my love for baseball at a young age when I would go outside with my little plastic bat and my tee and my ball. I was copying this guy. 2001, 2000, 2001, 2002. This man for the Chicago Cubs, Mm. Sammy Sosa. Those those years of him and Mark Aguirre going back and forth. I mean, Mark McGuire, not mm-hmm. Aguirre. Yeah. It was electric. And listen, forget about the steroid stuff. <laughs> it was the funnest era of baseball. Yeah. It's when a, it was still America's sport almost. Mm-hmm. Everybody in the country and most a lot of people around the world tuned in to see Sammy versus Mark McGuire. In yeah. their home run race. Mm-hmm. And just Sammy's personality, the way he just embraced Chicago and became Chicago's son, the way he swung, just, I I, I loved everything about Sammy Sosa. Yeah. And he, he was <laughs> one of the main reasons why I got into the sport and mm. yeah, used to just go out in, in my front yard and try to hit baseballs as far as I could. Because I would just see Sammy Sosa on the TV. It's funny because I never really was drawn to any of the steroid guys when I was younger. Well, I, when I was young, I really didn't even. I don't know. I how, didn't know anything about the steroids. Well, I just, just saw dudes hitting homers. I, I didn't so. either. And, and I mean, most of that stuff didn't come out till later. It's yeah. just funny when I go back and think about it. I wasn't a fan of Sammy Sosa. I wasn't a fan of Mark McGuire. Wasn't really a fan of Barry Bonds. I liked watching Barry Bonds and like the Barry was a he, yeah he was a Hall of Famer. I like I liked like so. watching all those guys um, in the home run derby, but yeah. never really latched onto them as players. Um, the only Chicago Cub that almost made my list was Alfonso Soriano. Um, nice. Him also hindered by going to the Yankees at the later stages of career of his career, similar to a lot of my players that didn't make my cut. Um, Just for fun, you should put Jeff Samarja on your honorable mentions list. Cubs pitcher, former Notre Dame tight end, great. <laughs> um, so funny thing now that I just realized, both of my number twos are Seattle Mariners. I love it. Uh, oh my god! So, oh, the one god. is easy. I'm, I'm, I'm upset at myself. I'm so mad because this this man deserves to be on my list, and he <laughs> wasn't. So my number two pitcher. Oh. Is the king himself, and we're not talking about LeBron, we're talking about Felix Hernandez. Felix was a beast. He was there for years yes. for the Mariners, dominated for 
almost his entire career, even towards the end of his career, was still having really good seasons. Dude was just a monster. Um, threw a lot of strikeouts, which was always exciting as a kid. Um, I liked the Mariners as a team. I just loved like the look of their jerseys and their logos and all that kind of stuff. So Felix Hernandez was an easy pick for for me for number two as a pitcher. And the <sighs> number two batter listen, was man. so easy as well. Listen, man. Ichiro Suzuki, how can I, you not like Out of him? respect for Ichiro, I'm sliding <laughs> Shohei Otani to six on the honorable mentions. Ichiro is my five. <laughs> I'm so mad that I, man, please go, go ahead, yes. please. This man would change the game for me. Um, just seeing him make plays in the outfield, the way that he, like, I had never seen um, – a batter that is basically running down to first as they're hitting, which is a very traditional Japanese player does that very often. Um, But it's the first time that we ever saw it really, because he was kind of the first guy to be successful coming from Japan. Um, He has so many records now at this point. And if you combine his stats from his Japan league to the U S in MLB, he has crazy numbers for average steals. Um, he he was a guy that was... He would rarely have an error. He was really good at everything. Mm-hmm. Like, they, there's the phrase master of none. Yeah. He's almost like a master of all. Yeah. Like, there, there's, there were no weaknesses to Ichiro mm-hmm. for most of his career. He had a couple of 20 home run seasons, he, I he believe. Was, he was never, like, a big power hitter. Yeah, but he could do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he, he just changed the game because he, he played it so differently but incredibly at the same time and just watching the way that he did things was was nuts to me your number two my number two is the one tiger on my list okay after sammy (laughs) it is funny how he became my favorite player it is through playing baseball video games Mm -hmm. as i became a sports gamer on the xbox and the playstation 2 Start playing. What was the game of the, it? Was it was before two K? Hmm. What was the game? MVP baseball. It wasn't. I I don't know if it was MVP baseball, but it wasn't the show. But it was the first time I started to like get into the Tigers. Mm-hmm. I played with them all the time on the game, and the first time I saw the name Pudge Rodriguez, <laughs> it just <laughs> seeing him. As like a catcher, seeing the name Pudge, Ivan Pudge Rodriguez, Mm -hmm. but then going deeper into the player he was, Hall of Famer, eight-time All-Star, great catcher, high-level hitter. He batted around 295 for his career, Mm -hmm. and the guy just won. He was a winning player everywhere he went. He won the World Series for the Marlins in 03. He was on that team. Mm Mm-hmm. He was on that team, right? I'm just checking. Uh, I believe so. 03, yes. He was with the Marlins in 03. He was on the 07 team that made the run. He he was just a valuable piece everywhere he went. He was on the Rangers team with Alex Rodriguez, I yes. believe, as well. Yes, that's where he started. Mm-hmm. He, he was just he was a really good player. And it started with his name and playing with him on the video game. And then just going into who he was as a player. And... Ivan Pudge Rodriguez just he became my guy. Mm. And as I embraced like Detroit sports, he just became like the face of Tigers baseball for me yeah. when I was younger. And I was just a huge Pudge Rodriguez fan. I think the funniest part about you putting Pudge at number two, he was one of my least favorite players. <laughs> that is hilarious. Uh, <laughs> Why? Um I think part of it was When the Tigers made the run, I just remember hearing people talking about Pudge all the time. And I started to get, like, you like the name Pudge? I started to get so tired of it. Oh, I loved it. Um, I loved it so much. Hearing people say Pudge, Pudge, Pudge. Um, Any any baseball player with, like, a weird name on video games, like Raleigh Finger, I used to pitch with him and his curly mustache all the time. I totally get it. I I latch (laughs) onto it, too. But for me, Pudge just wasn't doing it. Um, I don't know if it was because, like, I also didn't like Alex Rodriguez and – Pudge was another Rodriguez. I wasn't like, Alex I don't, man either. I don't know if that's maybe correlation. Um, and then I also just actually, uh, I had some people that I knew 
that would go to Tiger's games all the time and go to like signings and things like that. And they just said that Pudge was an a hole. So, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's that sucks. I guess that kind of like latched on to me. I guess maybe and, maybe he just wasn't a big like. I, yeah, I, I just love playing baseball. Right. Maybe that was just him. It's just it, it's funny. Um. So yeah, I mean it's a good pick either way. It, it's nice to have a tiger on, on each of our <laughs> lists. Um. All right. To the number ones. This, these were my easiest ones of all. Um, my number one would never change. My number one batter or pitcher, uh, pretty easy as well. Basically, these two guys got me into the sport of baseball. Um, I remember my dad showed me this pitcher um, when I was very young um, because by the time, even even by the time, I mean, around probably the time you were born or even a little bit after, he was starting to phase out of the league um, slowly, I guess, but he was still dominant. Um, the only man to ever hit a bird in a game. Listen, <laughs> the, the the 6'10 lefty. Yes. The man with the, oh, my God. The Randy Johnson. Arm. Yeah. Um, easy pick. One of the icons of the time. What was his nickname? I was about to say the big hurt, but that was Frank Thomas. Uh, geez, why am I, I remember his forgetting name. about it either? Too. I mean, his nickname. Yeah, I'll look it remember. up. Um, but Randy Johnson, like, just giant on the mound, lefty. I can't. Can you imagine how intimidating it was? Right. Seeing him walk up to that mound. Yeah. And Man. he, uh, he's just through heat. Oh, the big unit. Yeah, the big unit. Okay. Um, just through heat again. Played for the Diamondbacks for a while, so like. Cool, another almost cool every, logo. Almost every jersey he wore, it looked cool on yeah. him. Yeah, um, and that was kind of my first um, seeing a guy that threw that hard, I guess, um, or realizing consistently. It. Yeah, that he was throwing ninety seven, ninety eight consistently, um, and he was just it was just wild. And then I didn't, you don't even realize like how tall he is because when you're watching TV, they're on the mound, and you're like, oh yeah, they're they're all pitchers are all usually pretty tall and then like you stand them next to somebody else and you realize holy crap he's like the size of a basketball player um and now he takes photos for the nfl which is hilarious yeah. um he's living his best life at this point but randy johnson easily my favorite pitcher of all time and the number one batter if you've ever been around me at all it, it's an easy pick um it's one of the other reasons that I wear the number 24 it's another Mariner at one time a Listen, red the the idol of a whole generation of children uh, and the, again, the most popular sneaker in baseball history again the one guy that they said never did steroids the quote-unquote prettiest swing in baseball history and we talked about Vlad Guerrero's swag this the kid this man defined brought swag junior Ken Griffey Jr. is easily, by far and away, my favorite baseball player of all time. Listen, like you said, he defined you, the generation. You and millions of other 90s kids. Exactly. He was the guy. Um, I remember the, like the first thing I ever got for baseball was uh, a signed Ken Griffey Jr. baseball. And immediately, like when you get a signed baseball as a kid, you might not know exactly who he is right then and there. But right after, you look him up and you figure out what he's all about. And not only was did I have a signed baseball of Ken Griffey Jr. that, you know, is a generational talent, but, like, he was fun to watch as a kid. Like, I just remember watching the home run derbies, putting his hat backwards, just effortless, effortless swing. Um, I didn't even, you know, back then I could not care less about the shoes. Nowadays, I want the yeah. shoes. <laughs> like, I have a bit of a start to a Ken Griffey Jr. collection. Uh, that I want to get. I want to eventually try to find a, a signed jersey, but I want to get a pair of the shoes. They re-came out with the shoes. I would love to get that, maybe a baseball bat. Um, but he's like the reason that I got into baseball and the reason that I enjoyed the sport so much. So Ken Griffey, easily number one for a 90s kid. So <laughs> my number one kind of goes against – Everything I felt about the Tigers, <laughs> my love for Pudge Rodriguez, this man was a Tiger heartbreaker. 
Mm. He was a Yankee heartbreaker. And the time in my life where I enjoyed baseball the most, I'd say around like fifth, sixth grade, mm. fourth, fifth, sixth grade, when I was like tuning in to watch baseball like every other night on ESPN. And I became a fan of this team. Like a, a little bit before I became a Lakers fan between like 2007 and 2010. From like 05 to like 08 or 09, I was a Red Sox fan. I would wear I would, I'm muting your mic. I would wear Red Sox hats. I would watch them. I would oh, cheer for them. I remember. I and you like say this it was for Kobe, like it was Kobe for the Lakers. David Ortiz, man, number thirty-four, Big Poppy. <laughs> I don't know how it started. Yeah, but like everything from the way he wore his uniform to his chain, like hanging out of his jersey. It, <laughs> the way he swung, I used to try to try to copy the way he swung. Mm-hmm. Like he would swing through and just just go up with one arm. Yeah. How clutch he was. He always came through when his team needed him at the biggest moments. Uh, everything, the nickname, the just just all of it. Mm-hmm. His number I I was I just couldn't stop watching David Ortiz. Mm. And he to this day, he is easily my favorite baseball player. And the last time I consistently watched base watched baseball and was a big fan of the sport, it was because of him and it's blasphemous. I t- I supported the t- Tigers and the Red Sox at the same time, blasphemous. Yeah, but I did, hmm. and David Ortiz was a huge part of it. Yeah, I I just man, he's my favorite baseball player ever. Yeah, I can't blame I you for it. Him. I I hate despise the New York Yankees. Boston Red Sox. I can't stand him, but I can understand it. I respect his game. He's really good. Because unfortunately, on my list, Ichiro was a Yankee. Tejada was a Yankee. Granderson was a Yankee. I feel like Vlad Guerrero was a Yankee at the end of his career. But, um, yeah, those teams I could never root for. But David Ortiz was one of those guys that you're right. He, he, he came up clutch in a lot of situations, and I hated him for it. <laughs> Most uh, Tigers fans do. Most baseball fans do. Yeah. But he, the thing that I always give him respect for is he just seemed like he loved the game of baseball. Yeah. And that's what's fun. Um, he seemed like he just got pure enjoyment out of playing the game, uh, being there for the fans. Um, so I can respect that. Um, but yeah. Cool. Those are our top five. What? Little note. Black Guerrero ended his career as an Oriole. One year, 2011. Okay. No Yankees. I knew he went to somewhere else, but yeah. I couldn't. I just was saying I felt like every everybody ends their career with the Yankees. Last two years, Rangers and Orioles. Hmm. Um, a cu- I guess I'll quickly mention a couple of my guys that were almost on my list. I said Justin Verlander, Miguel Cabrera, Alfonso Soriano was almost there. Um, Juan Pierre, uh, mainly like a Dodger and a Marlin. Just guy that got a lot of steals. Carlos Beltran was on my list. Um, also led me to that fantasy championship one year. And rest in peace, Roy Halladay. Rest in peace, Roy Halladay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I used to love the Blue Jays as a team. And again, the logo, just the colors. Uh, like Especially when they were the blue and black jerseys. Um, Vernon Wells was another one. I have a signed baseball bat of Vernon Wells, which nice. is cool. Um, so a couple honorable mentions. Yeah. But uh, I'll, I'll add a few also. Go for it, yeah. I was always a fan of big bats. Mm-hmm. So Prince Fielder, honorable mention. Yep, he was fun. Yeah, especially with the Brewers. Yeah. Especially with the Brewers. Jim Tomei. Hated Jim Tomei. <laughs> big hated, man with a big bat. Hated the White Sox. <laughs> and Ryan Howard. Uh, Ryan Howard's a good one. Prime he, Ryan Howard. Ryan Howard, terrifying. Would, Ryan Howard would be on my top 10 list. Yeah, prime Ryan Howard was terrifying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, those are some good names. Anyway, this is just the start of some of the, the fun top 10 lists and stuff um, that we started today. Next week, we'll go over some more NBA Finals. Uh, maybe there's other news and notes. We'll see if we can talk about the Tigers. We'll see. Uh, maybe we'll do, do another short list. 
And then not too long after that, we'll probably get into full top 10 lists, maybe have some guests here and there um, to go through. But uh, we're already in June. Tomorrow. Time is flying, Joey. Yeah. We are 100 days from NFL kickoff. Not that far away from coach. This has been the views from the sidelines. We'll see you guys next time.